So there is a little bit of uh, change in the schedule. So we'll have one presentation that was planned to be now. Um, it's the reconciliation and peace process in the post-war context of Sri Lanka. Um, and it will be presented by two scholars, um, right? Um, so th this is the first one and then Instead of the other two presentations, we're going to have um, Victor Vakoya. Um, he was supposed to present um, tomorrow at noontime. Um, and um, he will present Herders and Farmers Violence in Nigeria. So um, we're going to have these two presentations. And I invite you guys from Sri Lanka um, to uh, share with us um, your knowledge. So good afternoon to you all. I'm uh, Ken Gadalan from Sri Lanka. I'm a working as a lecturer at the University of Yafna, we both. And unfortunately, we missed uh, two of our colleagues, uh, unfortunately. And uh, our research topic is, uh, you know, reconciliations uh, and peace process in the post-war context of Sri Lanka, a perspective of Northern province. I take a few slides, and uh, it's a main order. He will continue that one. And uh, you know, Sri Lanka, oh yeah, it is. And a basic background about the Sri Lanka, you know, it's an island, so, uh, country in the Indian Ocean, so uh, six uh, sixty-six thousand uh, square miles, multicultural society. We are Sinhalis and uh, Tamils and uh, Muslims and uh, other, you know, communities as living in Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka is uh, today is ethnically and uh, uh, religiously and linguistically and geographically divided society and to over 20 million people living in Sri Lanka. And the population is 74% uh, of British English and uh, so they are speaking Sinhala and 80% uh, of Hindus and uh, uh, they are speaking uh, Tamils as a Muslim as well as uh, they are speaking Sinhala and Tamil both languages. Uh, those are the you know the brief uh, about introductions about Sri Lanka. Uh, over the you know the three years, uh, decades voice uh, ruined Sri Lanka and uh, huge problems and hemorrhage of people and uh, you know other resources and the how you know the problem was emerged and uh, what how the research we carry out uh, what other you know the, we have interviewed variegated the people because we are coming from different discipline because we actually from the management. Uh, unfortunately, that's the reason we don't understand some related to the conflict and uh, management more advanced, you know, the technical jargon you are speaking. Anyhow, it is a basically how we conduct what's the people expectation from the, uh, from the northern province part of the Sri Lanka, how, you know, majority or minority of the people, uh, whether, whether their expectation had been satisfied or not. Those kind of the, you know, stuff we covered in our research. And uh, then uh, he's the main author, so he has an ex expert in you know, exp uh, the conflict management and how the conflict and uh, have the interviews or how this research is organized and uh, how we carry out this research and what other you know, recommendations and conclusions we uh, finally you know, gave. So uh, uh, I uh, leave this huge responsibility to my uh, main authors and uh, he will explain that one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gangadharan, and uh, I'm really happy to be here to present this topic, which is related to our country. And ladies and gentlemen, I think a very good evening to you all. So the next slide, I'm talking about the how conflict emerged in our country. So the when Sri Lanka became independent on 4th February 1948, so <coughs> from that day onwards, the Tamil minority has been anxious about the country's unitary form of government and he insisted that the Sinhalese majority people will abuse the Tamil rights. Really the, the independence in the 4th February 1948, really achieved by a very peaceful manner, without any conflict uh, among the societies. However, from that day onwards, the most of the Tamil minority people, they worried much about their rights. 
In year 1956, the legislative step by the newly elected Sinhalese nationalist government that proved discriminatory to Tamils, such as the declaration of Sinhala as a country, is one and only official language, and other were agricultural and university reforms that privileged the Sinhalese population at all. So that was the main reason why the conflict emerged between this society. Thus the civil war in Sri Lanka began as an ethnic hostility between two groups, the majority Sinhalese and the minority Tamil people. And apart from that, the Tamil politicians were moving from support the federalism to a demand a separate state that is so-called the Tamil Elam in the northern and eastern regions of Sri Lanka. So the, the main reasons why the com conflict emerged between these society because of the uh, st steps which was taken by the Sinhalese nat nationalist that is a discriminative manner to, f to give some favoritism to the majority people. Conflict and violation in the northern <coughs> east. So because of that, the conflict and violence in the northern east escalated in the 1980s, resulting in armed action against Tamil separatists pressing for self-rule. Most of the fighting <coughs> took place in the northern east, but the conflict also penetrated all over the Sri Lankan society. This conflict has a deep impact on traditions, structures, and institutions that had been foundation for their daily life, causing fundamental, irrevocable change in this process. So this picture shows us that where we took place the northern province of Sri Lanka, the head, of, uh, the head area of, of Sri Lanka, we took around five districts. We call it the Northern Province. So this uh, particular area is where the, the last battle taken place. The severe war uh, was there, all these places. The nature of conflict and its impact. The according to the Soma Sundaram is a well-known order and uh, psychiatrist as a professor in the particular university where we work. So the, he concluded that individuals, families and communities in Sri Lanka, particularly in the north and east, the north and east is so-called area where the minority people's homeland, called broader areas of Sri Lanka, have undergone 25 years war trauma multiple displacement, injury, detention, torture, and loss of family, kin, friends, homes, employment, and other valued resources. The damage inflicted was that of inequality, distrust, and loss of dignity, and indescribable violence and political repression. Because of this, Chronic conflict and distress emerged as a key issue between community. Thus, the essential condition for reconciliation aspect general view that all communities should be equal and treat them as equal, extending dignity, respect, and co citizenship to them. The three decades of war and its end. So, the, the three decades of actual physical war ended dramatically in the Vanni that so-called so area, where the three district belongs it over there in May 2009. So reported that over 40,000 civilian deaths, many more injuries and acknowledged war crimes, according to the University Teachers for Human Rights and the United Nations, approximately around 300,000 <coughs> Tamil internally displaced persons, IDPs, to camps, four months afterwards and allegations of grave violation of human rights and humanitarian law by 
both sides the militants and the militaries the underlying ethnocentrism and political causes remain unresolved so the objective of this study we really aim that to address the evolving nature of reconciliation and peace process in the post war context in northern province in the post war context sri lanka is a country coming out of three decades of civil war that has damaged the people life and social and economic capital of the nation so now we will move on to the main part of the what is reconciliation at all the most of the literature on the reconciliation does not refer to the international conflict but rather to conflict ranging from family to intercommunal and ethnic ones and civil war more specifically in sri lankan war we uh, probably we used to call it the ethnic conflict or the civil war uh, ledarch in 99 identifies the four main features of reconciliation truth mercy justice and peace so we mostly rely on this Uh, identification of the fa- four main pillars that has to be addressed in the Sri Lankan context as well, and also the Hersberg 2004 states that the action promoting truth, action promoting justice, action promoting security, and actions promoting regard are dimension of reconciliation. The truth and justice are not separate to reconciliation; they are key part of it. so these are the needs in the sri lankan context after the three decades of a war and recon- reconciliation may take place within divided societies or within one country after interethnic interracial or interreligious conflict and <coughs> the nature of the reconciliation in sri lankan context and the world context we focus uh, certain things over there the term reconciliation have been used in the countries like zimbabwe ireland south africa and east timor in intra state conflict groups can have very different goals ranging from integration as in south africa pluralism as in northern ireland to separation as in sri lanka and israel palestine so the people or the group of people who has to be reconciled reconciled should be based on the the objective and uh, for what or the goals for what they really <coughs> conflicted so the next the reconciliation and peace process in sri lankan context in the sri lankan context the reconciliation should be taken place within divided society where we specially call the tamils and singhalese majority and minorities thus in its simplest form reconciliation means restoring friendship and harmony between divided society in the war torn northern province of sri lanka the reconciliation and peace process structures are unfolding with efforts to strengthen the role of regional local and provincial governments and restore some measure of meaningful political solution that's that is the decentralization among the country's tamil minorities the reconciliation and peace process in the post war context of sri lanka there is an urgent need to change from the war and post war military mode of thinking for reconciliation and peace process this enable such environment to rebuild trust forgiveness among the communities who had chronic conflict for a longer time also promoting justice and reconciliation are the parts of post conflict peace building process the respect for the specific historical and cultural context of conflict and a domestic reconciliation process is essential so the reconciliation process immediately after the war so the government has taken uh, many range of activities to heal 
and give the peace process the affected people and the immediately after war the government uh, believed uh, the reconciliation can be done or can be a successful one through the infrastructure development of the particular war affected area and because of that the, the government has rebuilt the, the bridges and all the roads uh, so, uh, so as to satisfy the need of the people however the people expectation is not that and apart from that the government has taken the lesson learned and reconciliation commission to give us uh, some solution for the uh, war affected people however that the commission's report has not been addressed by the government it was really a meaningful effort and most of the people didn't believe the kind of activities which was taken by the particular government and also the nodon provincial council election was conducted during that uh, uh, that time because of the international uh, community pressures and later in 2015 the government established that's a government called the government for the good governance formed with a cross party political alliance of two largest politicians in sri lanka the government of sri lanka has put in place institutional structures to deliver a various peace building commitment with secretariat of coordination of reconciliation mechanism and operationalization of plan is guided by the government four pillars of support of transitional justice reconciliation good governance and resettlement and durable solutions however the effort what has taken by the government the people really they didn't believe on that and according to the the south asian director at human rights watch the families of victims of enforced disappearance frustrated by numerous government commissions that provided no answers that is the one example how people believed on the governmental activities and process on reconciliation in sri lankan context so the meaningful reconciliation of sri lanka right really <coughs> it has to be come from the the heart of mind so the whatever the activities the government take place and government has taken many initiatives and many activities after the war in the 2009 however the particular my, minority people they didn't believe because the all initiatives not really hum come from the heart of the mind it's only from the their mouth so the conclusion so the sri lankan government has failed to create the adequate institutional capacity and implement reconciliation and peace process in a trustable manner so the old societies say the buddhist ideology and hindu philosophy all people believe on that so it is the time the religious leaders has to play their role to bring the reconciliation and peace process in sri lankan context where is a very lack of participation of religious leaders in this process thank you very much